Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you went to the monetizing IoT present lecture? Okay, good. So now I'm going to give you some technical advice on how you can start it on an IoT solution using Microsoft Azure. What's the cloud? Uh, there's many um, definitions. The one shown here is just one of them. It's an approach to computing that's about internet scale and connecting to a variety of uh, devices and endpoints. In terms of Microsoft Azure, they take it as basically only uh, we want to give you an opportunity, a set of services and platforms so you can build your, um, your solutions at a scale. You don't have to worry about hardware. You, you can focus on your business objectives. There's three, uh, there's the basic taxonomy for cloud computing and it's just uh, as the beginning it's good to, to get a feeling of it. So you have the infrastructure as a service, services which is uh, basically you have to manage the infrastructure, the operating systems yourself. In Azure that would mean Azure virtual machines. You have the platform as a service um, models and services which is uh, where you don't need to worry about the infrastructure and you can focus actually on building your code and just deploying it. For instance, using Azure websites or cloud services. And then you have uh, the software as a service model where yeah, the software is just delivered to you as, you as a service. You consume it, you pay for what you use. It's important to know that like, you can use combinations of these three types of services. Just use whatever you need to, to uh, do your solution in the quickest and most convenient way possible. Uh, I would just say that, yeah, if you can, when building, when building code, try to use the platform as a service solutions as much as possible because you don't want to really manage the virtual machines, if possible. So what is the Internet of Things? It's a nice term. Uh, it's about uh, in interconnecting devices in the real world to, to the internet so that uh, we can do various stuff with them. We can ingress all the data they um, generate and uh, we can create uh, interesting uh, business analytics and uh, big data um, research on it. Or we can go even further and on top of that we can make different devices work better with, with each other so they synchronize they give you feedback on uh, basically on the different uh, parameters they're gathering and so on. Cloud computing is arguably the best option for hosting an Internet of Things solution because there's nothing else. It gives you the scalability you need. And uh, as I'm going to talk about a lot about B2B EOT delivery models, you, um, each client is different, each of your customers is different, and they're going to have um, very dif differing uh, requirements from the system. So yeah, Microsoft Azure offers an excellent set of services for the task. Uh, so you have your websites, your cloud services, different storage options, uh, communication uh, services, uh, Active Directory authentication, which is nice. Uh, and now they are really building a lot of stuff uh, related on machine learning, uh, big data research, and so on. So about this talk, I'm going to talk about the main business cases and uh, fundamental architectural challenges we uh, meet when building Internet of Things solutions. Uh, I'll focus particularly on the backend implementations with Microsoft Azure. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the communication models between your sensors and appliances and your backend. And I'll finish off with uh, giving you a, like a practical overview of the product we built at Bulgaria and maybe how it differs from uh, the architecture like Microsoft is promoting and how it's similar. So, Internet of Things architecture. Uh, there's a few things that almost any uh, cloud-based Internet of Things system would have in terms of components, which may be implemented in different ways. But you, of course, have your appliances and sensors. So, uh, this is uh, actually the, these are the devices that are generating your data. You have uh, usually some sort of a gateway, which may be as simple as an, uh, an agent, an HTTP client, maybe more complex than that. It can be managing just one sensor, it can be managing multiple sensors. 
but uh, that's basically something that uh, stands between your sensors and your backend. You'd have uh, the gateway service would be your um, backend's receiving point of all the data from your devices, and it can also be managing all the communication. Depending on the implementation, you can have uh, unidirectional connections, so you just get the data from your sensor, so you can have bidirectional connections, so you can uh, send them commands, uh, send them updates, uh, change their configuration, and so on. Uh, you typically have some management portals which allow you to uh, do some provisioning, so adding new devices into the ecosystem, um, or just changing their parameters, and from there on it depends really on the client. Uh, your data layer, um, I would say that uh, when you're working with large amounts of data, here's where, where and uh, in differing clients, here, here's where NoSQL really shines. So don't be afraid to use NoSQL databases. Microsoft has um, their document DB solution, which is a JSON based NoSQL database, kind of similar to MongoDB in a lot of ways. Uh, it, they also have uh, offer Azure table storage, which is a different kind of NoSQL um, solution. And uh, of course, you'll need some SQL databases, as you always do. From there on, uh, analysis, I've written here analysis module. What is an analysis module? That can be one service or a set of services that allow you to do something with the data. They can be completely separated from each other. So uh, you may be doing aggregations, you may be doing uh, some exposing the data to your clients in a particular way. So they can do, for instance, data mining or uh, other business intelligence um, tasks. Uh, of course, you need to think about also messaging between the modules. In Azure, that's done through the Azure service <coughs> bus. Um, I'll talk about it um, a little bit later some more, but uh, yeah, messaging uh, is crucial. I, my advice is don't underestimate it because it, it hurts. And uh, especially if you're building a, uh, like a um, package solution which you want to reuse across different clients, you always will need to think about uh, sort of an interfacing layer to their systems. They will be feeding you uh, data through various kinds of uh, files or databases. So, uh, and, and that's best separated to, to a, a different layer so you can uh, just not mess with the rest of the system, hopefully. So what are the main challenges in building such systems? Uh, for the technical challenges, uh, connectivity usually comes up. Uh, what happens when a gateway or an appliance is down? What happens there when there's bad connection? What do you do with incoming commands for uh, appliances which aren't online? So these are things we need to think about. Again, the messaging mechanism, which one to choose, how to implement it. Uh, the analysis, uh, here I just want to say that uh, uh, analysis here, it's really important to do good research so that you don't reinvent the wheel. Some, uh, as I'll show you later, some, for example, features in Azure can save you a lot of coding. Uh, and as in any system, performance is a big issue. But in IoT systems, it's even more crucial. You need to think about, first of all, all your services needs to be, need to be scalable. You need, to, uh, you need to be able to uh, create multiple instances of them, and uh, they need to be working well together. They, so uh, you need to uh, take this into consideration when you're doing your um, architectural design and uh, like structuring your code, for instance. And also the same thing applies to the storage. Uh, so uh, your databases, how scalable they are, uh, can you, uh, get multiple instances working together. How do you scale NoSQL databases? Uh, from the business side, the challenges are the customer demand, which is always varying. It's, uh, there's no two clients alike. Uh, securing the data usually comes up. And time and cost. Time and cost, there's a fine balance, uh, especially when working with Asia, between how much time you're going to spend on development and exactly what uh, kind of services you're going to purchase from Asia. 
So you need to think about running costs. Uh, for, for instance, uh, maybe if we work one sprint more, we reduce long term the running cost by 20%. And so this investment into the development hours will pay up later. So the Internet of Things and Microsoft Asia. There's a lot of uh, services offered in Asia. Uh, I can say I've used even 20% of those and this list is already outdated because it's from three months ago. And if you're new to Asia, there's a lot of options, too many options. So I'm just gonna uh, say a few words about the Asia offerings which are really suited for Internet of Things um, tasks. Yeah, and big data research because Internet of Things and big data go together. So you have the event hubs, which is part of the Azure bus service bus. That's a unidirectional uh, messaging uh, service, which if you <coughs> configure it right and you beef it up, you can get it to a million events per second. So it can, uh, you can send a million events per second and process them. Uh, it uses, um, it can send the messages both through HTTP POST or MQP protocols. Uh, but where it really shines is when you partner, uh, like where you pa when you pair it with Azure Stream Analytics. Azure Stream Analytics is a real-time analysis service. Uh, it takes as an input event hubs, so you just connect them. That's done through a portal. Just click next, 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 and uh, you can do some sort of uh, real-time analysis uh, based on the recent data. Uh, that's uh, one way you can save a lot of development time because through Azure Stream Analytics you can have multiple outputs. So you can output simultaneously to multiple storages. For instance, you can persist all your data. You can create some enrichments and uh, push it somewhere else to another database. As I mentioned, DocumentDB, Microsoft's NoSQL implementation, a lot of uh, work going there. there trying to improve it constantly. You have the HD Insight, which is uh, Microsoft's Hadoop solution. So again, yeah, you get all the data and it does things which yeah, are beyond me. I'm not a data scientist. And again, cool stuff, Asia machine learning. Uh, so that's Microsoft's uh, solution for doing machine learning jobs. Um, it takes a variety of input data sources and you can choose, they have a number of um, predefined algorithms for like decision trees, uh, clustering and so on. Or you can create your custom ones using R and it builds a model for you. Uh, the cool thing is um, when you build the model, it also creates a web service which then you can call for your, from your application, for example, for categorization tasks. And you just call the service and it will uh, return the, the category for which, for example, this product record goes into. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the service uh, assisted communication model for connected devices. Um, that's uh, basically a model for um, structuring your architecture for the communication between your appliances and your backend. Devices generally live in uh, local networks, uh, they're limited in scope, and uh, we assume that all connections um, to and from the device are at least uh, facilitated but by some sort of gateway. Uh, and we only rely on outbound connectivity, meaning that the connection will be established from the device to the core, not the other way around. So that way we don't need to worry about opening any ports in the firewalls or anything like that, inbound ports. I mean. So that's how that looks. Uh, yeah, here you have the devices. They're connected to a local gateway. There may be multiple devices connected to a single gateway. The connection is established that way. And here you have your, that should be say gateway service, which is publicly accessible. You can do authentication, whatever you need. And uh, you can facilitate, then after the connection is open, you can start doing bi-directional communication if you need. Now the 
bad thing here is, well, not the bad thing, but this model gets even better. If you have some sort of an intermediary layer uh, that provides a scalable queuing model or sort of a relay. So if something happens to the gateway service or uh, the um, local gateways and the appliances are down for some reason, you don't lose any data. And uh, just the messages will be forwarded to the correct uh, gateway or the gateway service uh, whenever it's online. It also can somewhat help uh, in uh, reducing uh, spikes in messages where the server might not be able to uh, process them all at the time. So you can implement it in a way that you don't lose any data. So the reference architecture, I'm going to show you something which uh, I believe Microsoft thinks of as, a, as the way that uh, a good reference architecture for developing um, Internet of Things applications with Azure. Uh, so here you have your devices. As, uh, that's showing that you can have different kinds of devices with simple agents. Or here you have some kind of more custom device, which is communicating by uh, some obscure protocols or something to a field gateway, which will also have an agent. And what they recommend is using the Azure Event Hubs. The Event Hubs, you, um, an important thing for them is that you can process the stream simultaneously from multiple places at once. The messages are kept for uh, between one and seven days. You can configure that but you can process them from multiple locations or multiple services. So when, the, when uh, the messages are sent in the event hub, you can immediately start processing them through, let's call it an event processor, uh, and do some either real-time visualization or some custom enrichment of the messages. And uh, then you can put them in the database. That's one way to go about it. Or you can hook up the streams, the, the event hubs directly to the stream analytics. And from there, you can put them directly into SQL database or like you can filter some of them and put the important one in SQL database. Uh, an example here is what if you are looking for faults in uh, some sensors and you just want to persist in SQL the ones which are really critical or the, the real errors. And uh, in Azure Blob Storage, you can just put everything, maybe even unprocessed, so big data analysts can later go on, take the data, and do magic with it. Or uh, you can also connect it to Microsoft's BI2 Power BI. That's currently in preview. I don't know when it's general availability, but it's convenient again. Or as I said, you can even create new event hubs which, uh, which can then be used by your other services for uh, visualization, for basically whatever you need. Uh, the top part is, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, you have a, generally some s sort of device state store where you're monitoring which devices are online, which, which of them are alive. And uh, you have identity and registry, store, registry stores, which is related to authentication and knowing that a gateway is known. And uh, you have some, uh, usually some sort of provisioning API, so you can create, uh, add new gateways to the system. And your solution portals, which uh, might vary greatly in functionality. The idea here is, uh, yeah, generally the, always the, the, all the data goes to some sort of storage or even multiple storages. So, Azure, just a sec. Okay, we're going really well with the time. Azure and IOTA. IOTA is uh, the solutions we at Strives and with our colleagues from ITCT Automatizing. We are building in uh, Bulgaria. <laughs> It stands for Internet of Things Analytics. Um, we generally, it's used on a B2B basis, so we package, sell this solution to, um, to our clients. We configure it from them. Sometimes they need um, custom features. And it's about connecting their sensors and sometimes legacy systems to the cloud. 
um, that's we, we have our own gateways for that job. Uh, the Yota Core is the Azure-based central processing system. That's your whole backend. That's a set of uh, services in the cloud which uh, facilitate uh, all the analytics, data storage, everything you need. And uh, recently, we also rec um, for some clients we are pushing some BI interfaces so they can do data mining on their own. So um, here, uh, yeah, that's the basic picture. You have the Yota gateway. It communicates via the internet to the core. It's simple as that. Different, uh, there's different implementations of the Yota systems for, for different clients. Some of them wanted to use MongoDB. Okay, that's possible. So it's like, uh, it's like uh, phone blocks. I don't know if you've seen that. So you, you just take the elements of the system you need for each client. Uh, other clients needed regression services, pretty simple but pretty effective. Um, for one of the other clients, we did a scripted business rules service. The cool thing is that when you create a custom feature for a client, then you go back and think about, okay, so afterwards, how can we make that generic? And you do a little bit of work, make it generic, put it in the product, and you have a new feature, and you can sell it to the next client. So the challenges we needed to address in the IoT is the, the same challenges as before, like the customer demand that one customer might have just 10,000 gateways, but is pushing a lot of data through them and wants to do business, uh, uh, wants a business intelligence service. Another client may have a million devices and uh, what they want to do is uh, just uh, be able to push updates to them so they can update their software. Um, securing data, again a challenge. Uh, Azure has good service, uh, good solutions for that through uh, Azure Active Directory, and you can integrate, of course, to your um, on-premises Active Directory. And yeah, again, balancing the time and cost. So cherry picking what sometimes a, f a service from Azure might be the thing you need. For example, Azure Machine Learning might be all you need. So the solution we have is uh, we have a package solution, a set of services which we can uh, reconfigure and uh, push to each specific client. Uh, that minimizes the work done for each of them. Uh, we have an intelligent gateway which uh, can manage uh, multiple sensors at once and uh, we have our own, uh, I would say not very complex but workable protocol for uh, receiving data and sending different kinds of co commands to the gateways to configure them. And enhance security, yeah, that's uh, the Azure Active Directory stuff. So what's the impact? Our clients get predictive maintenance because uh, they can monitor uh, their devices and uh, see when they're going wrong and act preventively before a fault occurs. Uh, they can improve their knowledge in the um, systems for predictive diagnostics. Basically, they can learn more about uh, what's the signs that the device is failing because you get aggregated data from uh, whole populations of devices. And uh, you yeah, get sort of a predictive marketing in a sense that uh, uh, clients can understand how their, pro their devices are used and uh, they can find ways to improve them through the data gathered. So the architecture we have, it's kind of different than uh, what's available in uh, yeah, what's the Microsoft reference for IoT architecture. But here we have the gateways and uh, the IOTA gateways and uh, all kinds of sensors, which communicate to a gateway service. Uh, we don't use Azure Event Hubs because they're unidirectional. Uh, they're very fast, but they're unidirectional. And for that reason, we are using WebSockets, which is simple to implement and work really well. Um, yeah, the pure event hub solution would not allow sending commands and uh, configuration from the core to the gateways. Uh, hopefully, 
This will be addressed in Asia in the future by some bidirectional service. Um, authentication is done through uh, Azure Active Directory authentication library. And as you can see here, so we have internally a data service which is uh, which uh, through which you can access all the data stores underneath, be it uh, NoSQL, uh, the configuration of SQL database. Uh, we are now also using some aggregation SQL databases. Um, and uh, all the services which need it can access it through that layer. There's a set of uh, different uh, analysis uh, services which work completely independently of, of, each, of each other. So you can deploy only the ones the clients need. For example, only you can deploy only the business rule service if uh, the client doesn't need a fault service or a prediction services. Uh, the beauty of it is uh, that we can scale each component as much as the client needs. You can scale the business rule service to have 10 instances if, they, if the client has a lot of business rules and they're computationally heavy. Uh, or you can scale the gateway service if, you, if the client has um, a lot of gateways. And there's also the, yeah, the, the user layer, which is the application and the portals. These are usually client specific. Uh, there's some reusability there, but uh, it's limited. So how does the Yota Gateway work? We uh, think of sensors as managed objects and we support different kinds of protocols to, uh, for them to connect to the Yota Gateway. Uh, the Yota Gateway is also responsible for configuring these sensors in some situations. For instance, it may say uh, just uh, this parameter value, I want to increase it by one, whatever that means. So that's something that the Gateway does. And uh, the managed objects, they send their data reports. The gateway packages the reports from all sensors and pushes it through the internet to the, um, to the core. There's also an interesting software architecture layer on, on the gateways themselves. Uh, we have a plugin framework, framework, it's written in Python. And uh, basically for each client implementation, Whenever, uh, whatever uh, sensors you're be, uh, they'll be using, we just load the plugins that are required for that sensors. And if they have sensors we haven't worked with before, yeah, we, we have to write new plugins. But it's simple enough. Uh, yeah, the support hard hardware platforms, uh, some of them are, <laughs> it's an interesting thing, Raspberry Pi, you'll generally uh, hear people saying, yeah, Raspberry Pi is not, good for IoT solutions and for, um, for large solutions, yeah, it probably isn't, but we've had a very interesting project and we still do uh, for home uh, monitoring your home energy and uh, home energy production. In the Netherlands, it's uh, very popular to have a solar panel and uh, we have a solution so people can monitor how much energy they're producing, how much energy they're consuming and uh, they can get a rough estimate of uh, how their bill is going to be affected. Uh, and it's really simple, but it, it works. You have um, smart meters. A lot of people have smart meters in their homes, which uh, gather the, all the um, consumption data from the, their whole houses. So that sends reports to the gateway. We, all, uh, we also have another kind of sensor which gets the data from the solar panels. and then when we get the reports in the core, it's really easy to aggregate the data and show it in a beautiful graph. But even that simple data can, for instance, show you, yeah, that was a sunny day in the Netherlands because you have a lot of production. And you can see when people got home and uh, started making maybe dinner. This is interesting. Uh, especially when you start aggregating more and more data, then uh, you can get a data scientist to actually get it all in and uh, try to look for some interesting patterns. And uh, they, you can do regional analysis and so on. Okay, so what happens after we get the reports uh, from our sensors to the gateway, they're sent to the gateway service and they end up in document DB. Uh, 
we run a set of customers, specific set of services uh, on the connected objects. So that might be alarming services. For instance, we can immediately notice that uh, the value sent from a gateway that, that do not seem right. So we, we can generate alerts. Uh, you can do prediction, some easy predictions based on the recent data or uh, even long-term data. Uh, you can let the clients uh, run their business rules. And uh, yeah, you can also provide them with some dashboard services, which are again related to business rules and predictions. I'm just going to show you a very simple example. That's a, a system built in something like a IOTA predecessor system where a simple linear regression algorithm was used to predict uh, faults in boilers. And linear regression is very simple, but it's very effective. And it allowed the client to predict where and um, to actually manage where their technicians go to optimize their work. So doesn't, it doesn't have to be rocket science, even something simple can have great value. For another client, uh, we were uh, loading uh, millions and millions of records from uh, trains, train sensors. And they wanted to do um, some, some of their own business rules. And for that, we provided them with a CS script business rule engine. CS scripts are basically yeah, C sharp scripts. Uh, they run quite well. We store them in the configurational database and for a simple workaround, a batch job just keeps re-executing the business rules and generating the necessary side effects. Whether it's alarms, it may send an email to someone uh, or it can simply flag something as red, something that needs attention. And that again, not terribly complex logic, but great value for the customer because uh, Actually, by law, they're required if some sensors fail to stop the train from, uh, to not let it uh, go further on. And uh, that way they can manage that. And they can uh, simply see uh, if there are any faults occurring in the train. So actually, that's everything I have. And I'm open to questions now. Yep. Yeah, in the beginning, so I'm just going to tell you how the story started so you can get an idea how it evolved that way. No, I'm interested in the success story on the client side. So okay. about uh, quite a lot of different instruments. Mm. Yes, but uh, why the customer needs such, such instruments instead of, uh, for example, just a script database inside something like that? So, yep. Uh, Okay, uh, well maybe the, the greatest success story would be, I would say the trains. Uh, why, uh, they actually in that project, they're not even using document, if they're using Mongo. Uh, they needed a large throughput of data. I mean, SQL, you can configure it to do that. Yeah, uh, just Mongo was, uh, in this situation better for the task and uh, the reports varied in the schema so it was convenient uh, why they chose this solution uh, yeah that would, that would be a good question I mean uh, basically our, con our consultants in the Netherlands offered this to them to build it to build this system and they liked it I mean I don't know how else to present it Yeah, de depending on the case. They, they wanted to run their own business rules. That was the main thing. And uh, they had some uh, 
very complex rule systems about when an alert should be raised. And basically the main, the main challenge there was to actually be able to uh, run the business rule engine fast enough. So executing the business rules when the data is imported so that uh, a technician on the platform can immediately see if they need to do something with the train to fix something. Of course, there were challenges there. It's, uh, it was a complex project. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But is it, is it kind of SDK which you provide as an instance, yes, or for the business, or how it's done? For example, I have a lot of devices and I want to connect mm -hmm. and what next then from your side to integrate it? Yeah, uh, we currently do not have a, really an SDK and we do the deployments for the client. Mm -hmm. So we, when we gather their requirements, we'll decide which of all the services available mm -hmm. or all the features they need. Mm -hmm. And from them, uh, from there, uh, you generally have a, some sort of Azure subscription and you start deploying stuff. You start deploying the gateway service, how many instances you need. For example, business rule service, you create data storages, uh, you start importing their configurations or they can do it themselves. And uh, the configuration actually is the key. It, it, gets, it gives you the data for the, for the appliances. So yeah, we can do the link and actually they can, the, the gateway and the gateway service can talk to each other. But who does it? You do, do it, yes? Yeah, we, we do it, we do it, yeah. And uh, we offer support, I mean, afterwards we offer and support. Where is business? Sorry? Where is business? In what is business? What is, uh, how do you get the money out of them? Uh, the client, okay, so we charge them for um, any development, additional development we need to do per client. Uh, we also, I'm not 100% sure on, on that, but I think we also own the subscriptions or um, we manage the subscriptions at least. So uh, there's billing for that as well, like long term, in addition to the Azure charges that's negotiated in the beginning of the project. And uh, also usually, at least in the project so far, there's uh, feature requests afterwards, which we get additional development from later. How the data is calculated, yes. I mean, everything is negotiable, basically. You need to talk without be, with our business guys, but yeah, I would say yes. I mean, and uh, actually, that is the case in, in the trains project. The business rules, the new, we have new business rules coming in, and they are written from the client's developers. They have to sync with our developers to know what's available, but yeah, we work together. Yes, yes, yeah, no, 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 it's, uh, you can get, you can get business reports. I mean, uh, depends how you build them. You can uh, offer them a service, like a, uh, a publicly available service. So the clients can either do their reports themselves or intermediary, you can do it like a simple report and uh, make the it. Yes, and that is the case actually in some of the project, our clients, they have their own clients, so it becomes like a multi-tenant sort of, yeah, yeah. yeah. And is it, is it based on the measures I mentioned, or can you do uh, How you create the reference at the end? How you, sorry? Uh, measures and dimensions, you know, this business intelligence. Uh, it or depends on the tooling, I, I guess oh. the business intelligence tooling used. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have more time? One more small question. Okay. Gateway is actually a Raspberry Pi with some extensions and so on, yeah? E yes, in some of the implementation, it can be running on Linux. Yeah, on any Linux. Yeah. 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 I have a particular question regarding uh, applicability of Raspberry Pi yep. for 
business need, the, mm -hmm. the storage is an SD card, which is actually not a perfect solution no. for, for a device yep. on the long run. Uh, connectivity, uh, I'm pretty sure you experience issues with, uh, or your customer experience issues with uh, connectivity, because uh, mm -hmm. business clients usually don't let you to, to get in, into their network and so on. Absolutely. We we wouldn't be uh, we wouldn't be deploying anything on like a properly business thing on a Raspberry Pi. So that was done for the pilot project. Uh, Sorry, actually, maybe. This, uh, this is yeah. Just a, just a gateway. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the device could fail, and this is as it's run uh, Linux after next reboot, it <coughs> can just don't go up. Sorry. Do you, uh, how do you solve uh, gateway issue, crash? Stability issue because uh, storage. Is SD card and mm -hmm. Raspberry, so you can lose your gateway. I don't know once a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can say I don't. I don't think we have experienced so far such issues. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I don't have an answer for you. So you, you trust the SD card. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we don't store a lot of data on the. We tr the gateway doesn't do calculations yeah, on anyway, its own alone. It's a Linux in it. Yeah. And you have I'm not really into the uh, gateway um, framework. I know that uh, there's some protocols written there so it can restart itself and try to even um, re reboot it to the um, like base software version if it fails, something like that. Uh, but apart from that, mm, no. Okay, one more question. How mm -hmm. do you handle software updates for gateways? Okay, uh, so in our case, uh, what we have is uh, we host them somewhere, uh -huh. so they're available. And uh, we just send the gateway the, the link to the, okay. from where they can get the updates. So it's a kind of, of chat or some deployment? Yeah, we, we simply, the, the gateway service only sends the command and the yeah. gateway does the, the rest of the job. Okay. Uh, actually, there the import of data is a little bit different. It uh, happens only on tr on train stations, and it's downloaded and sent to us. So it's a little bit different. Um, we we would love it to be direct, like all the time, because when you upload a lot of data at once, that creates issues. But yeah, maybe in the future. Yeah, and it's uh, limited. Capacity is limited by Raspberry again. No, th there, there's no Raspberry there. It's just direct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.